Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar on Brexit, intellectual property rights and heritage, what you need to know. My name is Carmen Talbot and I'm the project manager for Heritage Digital. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar as part of our National Lottery Heritage Funded Heritage Digital Programme. Now, I noticed in the chat, I, I, I'm, I'm loving all the weather reports in the chat. Somebody saying a not so sunny Plymouth. I'm actually coming from a sunny Totnes this morning. So I'll try and push some of this weather front 20 miles down the road to you. Firstly, there's, there's a little bit of introduction and, and background on the project from me, and then I'll, I'll pass over to Naomi. Now, Heritage Digital is a consortium project of four partners fusing heritage and digital skill experience. Together, we create free, high quality digital skills training events and resources for the UK heritage sector. And we welcome staff, volunteers, trustees, and freelancers associated with heritage organizations to engage with our program. The project is led by the Heritage Alliance. And we are a charity and we promote the role of the independent heritage sector. We're a membership body and we have over 150 heritage organization members. If you're interested in joining or supporting our work, please do get in touch. The main work of the Alliance is to influence the government on behalf of the ind independent heritage movement and facilitate connections between organisations, both within and outside the sector. We also run capacity building and support projects like this one, for example, and our other National Lottery Heritage Fund supported COVID-19 response programme, Rebuilding Heritage. Now, a bit about our project partners. Charity Digital are our digital technology specialist partner. They're hosts of the project website and mailing list and event managers of our webinars and virtual events. It is their expertise that makes everything run so smoothly. Fingers crossed. Media Trust are our digital communications and marketing specialist partner. They're designers of our beautiful downloadable guides and they are linked to leading organizations in the world of digital through their corporate partners. Finally, Today's webinar hosts are our digital rights specialists, Naomi Corn Associates. Now, it is very likely that some of you in the virtual room today will have heard of them already. They're one of the UK's leading information management consultancies, specialising in intellectual property rights, data protection and licensing, and they lead on support on these topics to the heritage and arts sectors. Naomi Corn Associates supports their clients to develop better rights and privacy policies and awareness through training and consultancy services, including a forthcoming toolkit for archivists on data protection that's been commissioned by the National Archives. Now on the subject of data protection, if you missed the live broadcast of our Heritage Digital webinar on data protection and Brexit last week, this will be available as a recording in the coming weeks. Now, before I ask Naomi to join me, there are a few housekeeping points. The presentation element today will be 45 minutes long and includes some of the pre-submitted questions from the Padlet board we circulated in the last few weeks. There'll be 50 minutes at the end for live audience Q&A, so if you have a question for Naomi, please type it in the box marked Q&A at the bottom of your screen. In all of our webinars to date, we've received far more questions than we've had time to answer, so if we can't get to yours, we will look to cover it in the Cover Home Digital Guide. Feel free, and as you already are, use the chat to introduce yourself to others and flag any technical issues that you may have. The recording of this session and the presentation slides will be made publicly available after the event and emailed directly to everyone on the Heritage Digital mailing list. We will aim to get this done in the next two weeks. We're using an AI captioning service for this event. And for those on Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, you should see an option to turn on closed captions. It may say CC. I mentioned the forthcoming guide above. There will be a downloadable guide to support this webinar coming out in March, as well as the guide on the impact of Brexit to data protection. The best way to stay up to date on all the heritage digital content is to sign up to the project mailing list. And finally, we hope you, can, you, we hope you will enjoy this webinar and will give us feedback via the form sent out after the event. Now, I'm delighted to introduce your speaker for this session, Naomi Korn. Naomi, will you please join me on the screen? Hello. Hi. Hi. Now, Naomi is the founder and managing director of Naomi Korn Associates. She's one of the leading experts in the UK on copyright, data protection and GDPR, as well as rights and licensing. She's been supporting the public, corporate, education and charity sectors on rights management and rights exploitation for the last 20 years. Welcome, Naomi. 
Thank you, Carmen. Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be leading the webinar on Brexit, IP rights and heritage. And um, as Carmen said, I've incorporated many of the questions that you sent in advance into the presentation already. So thank you so much for those. And I'll be taking hopefully as many questions as I can at the end of today. So come and thanks again for um, setting this up. And also um, thanks to our friends at Charity Digital for um, basically making this webinar hopefully as uh, kind of seamless and um, all the tech support that you have given us. I will see you at the end, Naomi, for the Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Excellent stuff. Good. OK, so um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to my team. Um, I am the front woman for the amazing work that's done by Patrick Gibbertson and Maddie Beeson. Um, so we've we've been a growing company um, quietly over the last few years, particularly. And Patrick joined us from the Museum of London and Maddie joined us from the Imperial War Museums. And it's together that we're able to support the sector in all the various ways that we do. And a massive shout out um, to my team for the amazing work over the last year during lockdown, during a really hard kind of period of time. And they have just been absolutely phenomenal. So um, what are we going to be covering today? Um, there is a fair amount of impact um, regarding intellectual property rights as a result of the UK leaving the EU, but I have focused in on a number of key areas, um, particularly those that relate to copyright, orphan works, um, the European Court of Justice rulings, the database right, and trademarks and design rights. Now there are others. Now there'll be a few of you that might be interested, for example, in patents and the impact of Brexit on patents, but because of the time limitations that we have today, I am not covering those, but I will recommend that you look and you go to the Intellectual Property Office website. And that's the main source of advice that has guided us in the, in the preparation for this webinar today, but that will give you more information about the impact there. So in addition to providing you with an overview of how Brexit has affected the heritage sector in terms of intellectual property rights, I've also done a bit more work and what we've done is we've uh, compiled for you some action points, a bit like what we did with the data protection webinar. So things that we would recommend that you do next in order to prepare yourselves for the changes that have happened. But before we start, a little poll for you. Um, we're going to, um, we'd like to find out um, right now um, whether you think Brexit will affect your organization's IP related activities. So could we have the poll live please? And then we'll do uh, the normal procedure, give you a few seconds, about 20 seconds to complete the poll, and then I'll read out the answers. So um, what do you think? Do you think, the, do you think the Brexit will affect your organization's IP related activities? Is it a yes? Is it a no? A maybe or a don't know? And if you could complete your answers now, please. Give you another five seconds. And if we could have the results, please. Okay, so I'll read them out to you. Um, those of you who thought that the answer was yes, there are 54% of you, so that's 149 of you think that the answer is yes. Those of you who thought the answer is no is 14, so that's 5%. And maybe 57 or 21%, and I don't know, 54 or 20%. So there's about 40% of you that aren't quite sure. Um, and uh, that's going to be interesting to see um, whether you would feel after today's webinar that in fact um, something's changed there. So thank you very much indeed for completing the webinar for us. Okay, so, uh, sorry, the poll for us. So let's get into the main context context of today. Now, intellectual property rights, what do we mean? Now, first of all, um, copyright protects creative works and it's an automatic right. Okay, so that's one of the, the family members of the intellectual property rights family. We also have the database right, which is also automatic. It's also referred to as the sui generis right. And it protects the investment that's made in the identification and obtaining and presenting of data. Okay, and we'll be coming back to all the embolded members um, as part of our webinar today. Trademarks protect signs or symbols that distinguish one product or a service from another. So if you just think about some of the really kind of familiar trademarks, McDonald's or Coca-Cola, okay, Dyson, 
Okay, so those are trademarks. They are words that distinguish a product or a service. And actually, did you know that the McDonald's jingle is also trademarked? So you can also trademark sounds as well. That's very distinctive. And when you hear the McDonald's jingle, that's very much the McDonald's jingle. Okay, we've got the design right as well, which protects something's eye appeal, something's unique shape. And if we were in a real life room, I would hold up to you a water bottle. Okay, they're, they're a really good example of the sort of contemporary eco-friendly products that all of us are using and um, if you look at uh, water bottles you'll see that many of them will have unique designs and they are very likely to have been protected by um, the registered design rights and we also have other family members moral rights and patents and performance rights I won't be covering those today um, but you can find from our website loads of information about what they are and what they protect as I said the emboldened intellectual property rights family members are those that I'm going to be covering so let's go into a little bit of scene setting um, in order to um, move us forwards. Um, now, the bottom line is that um, a bit like data protection as well, the very registration, protection and management and use of intellectual property rights has changed um, as a result of the UK leaving the EU. So that this was really at 11 o'clock on the 31st of December everything changed. And so what we're going to be doing today is looking at the impact on heritage organisations. Um, as I said earlier, the advice of this presentation is based upon the latest information from the Intellectual Property Office. Um, but please, please do go onto their website. You've got the URL there and you can find out more information. Now, a little refresher as well before we start on our journey in, in any great depth that I want to remind you about the prevalence of intellectual property rights for our sector. Um, and actually I've delineated it into three different types of ways in which um, we may come across intellectual property rights. So first of all, there are those intellectual property rights and it's particularly copyright actually for us um, that's automatically arising as a result of creating new works. Um, and that would also involve and include when we commission other people to create works for us or create content and also contract third parties to create stuff. So that could be a learning resource for us. It could be an artist that we're commissioning to maybe create a unique illustration for us to um, maybe exemplify or help uh, help others to interpret our exhibition um, exhibitions or collection items. There are also other types um, of ways in which we will come across IP other than those that are automatically arising and they and those they are those that can be activated by certain activities that we see widely across the heritage sector. So that might be publishing, that could be a leaflet, a pamphlet, um, that could be a little handheld guide to take people around our collections or co around our buildings or around our spaces. That could be our um, online uh, publishing activities that would include our collections online. Um, I've also included in here other ways in which IP might be activated. So that could be uh, when we talk about activating as well, it could be that we have items in our collections, but actually we never really come across the intellectual property rights um, as a practical issue that needs um, immediate resolution until we come to use those items. However, I should also be very clear in the industry standards that we rely on, the, particularly the collections management standards and spectrum, which have within the standard um, the procedure of um, acquisition and actually to preempt any activities where we might activate IP that we actually deal with copyright, particularly when we acquire works into our collections. OK, so I think that's important to say. Um, and I've also noted here that there are other ways in which we might activate IP for for example, when we commercial, commercialize or exploit um, intellectual property rights that could arise as a result of um, new items being created. And indeed, there's also the digitization activities that many of us will be involved in. And finally, um, I've also um, given a little nod to the types of intellectual property rights that might be activated because we've registered those. And this again should remind us about the role for some of us that um, trademarks might have for example, some particularly some of the national museums or some of the um, maybe large organizations or specialist heritage organizations might already have explored avenues where there's a registration of intellectual property rights, particularly something like a word um, or a logo um, that we can actually uh, use in order to represent our brand values and who we are. 
So let's now move and let's look specifically at copyright and let's look at how Brexit has impacted uh, copyright and our management of copyright works. So again, I would like to just remind us specifically about copyright, that copyright will sit within our collection items, okay, so a myriad of different items we'll all have across our sector that will include photographs and drawings and paintings and videos, um, oral history recordings, okay, uh, letters and other types of archival material. So we have an enormous range of collection items that we hold collectively, we're custodians for on behalf um, of our sector. Um, we also will uh, see a rise in copyright issues associated with items that we might be borrowing as part of our exhibition activities. Um, I've also mentioned, and it's important that we keep referencing this, commissions. And certainly if you're interested in finding out more specifically about some of the issues that arise when you commission or contract people to create content for your heritage organisation, I'd like to flag up the resource that we created as part of um, the Heritage Digital Alliance and the particular guide on copyright when working with suppliers and commissioning content. So please do have a look at that. That's available on the Heritage Digital website for free use now. Um, there's also interpretive content that might include copyright works and of course digital media publications and any online activities that we're involved in. Perhaps thinking more as well about how we're perhaps connecting with our audiences during COVID and the role that online collections have and online activities and the inherent copyright issues there. Okay, so a very general scene setting for you, just so we know what we're talking about. So. How has Brexit affected our management of copyright works? Well, it's important to say that um, even though we have now left the EU, um, the UK has continued to commit to buy uh, multilateral agreements, which have effectively protected most copyright works that have been protected in the EU and in the UK. Um, so, so nothing has changed on that front. And certainly the duration of copyright, um, whether it was pre uh, the UK belonging to the EU or subsequent to Brexit has not changed. Okay, so here there is no change. The way in which generally we treat copyright works, the levels of protection remain the same. And this is, and if I just throw in here the word burn, okay, the burn convention, many of you would have heard me talk about this before. We're still um, a signatory to the burn convention. So the basic premise upon which our copyright law sits is the same as it was, however. A significant change is not actually happening right now, but will be happening in April of 2021 as a result of the UK leaving the EU. And here, um, let's talk in more detail about why that is, and it's because of the EU Copyright Directive. So for a few years, there have been um, a number of intense conversations um, across EU member states about the need to harmonise copyright laws better and create a better framework for users to engage with copyright works. Now, I should say that the UK has already seen substantial changes to its copyright framework as a result of the 2014 new exceptions to copyright that were integrated within our legislative framework way back way back then. And in fact, the EU copyright directive was, was if you like, a bit like the uh, rest of Europe catching up with the UK. Um, however, the EU copyright uh, directive is actually better uh, for users than what we have in the UK. And I've given you here an outline of this. These are their articles three, six and eight to 11, which provide enhanced exceptions for museums um, and also libraries and archives include in Include, including, importantly, some out of commerce provisions. And I will come back to that as we go through our webinar. Um, there is also um, Article 14, which I think perhaps for many um, heritage organisations joining us today, there will be some of you who will be breathing a little sigh of relief about this one, because there's actually a proviso in Article 4, uh, 14 where museums can't claim copyright in public domain work. So that doesn't apply um, to the UK. And there's also an additional um, article, Article 15 of importance and relevance to us, which is um, putting an increased imperative on social media platforms to take responsibility for the behaviours of their users and, and within the form of um, a shift from the current takedown model that they use, so they take down content that's infringing, to more of a moderation model, which they have very much resisted because this is actually a big impact on their current business model, but it is um, part of the EU copyright directive. So 
Just a little bit of extra context about this, EU Copyright Directive is being transposed across the EU um, by April 2021, so later this year, the UK government initially said yes it would implement it and has flip-flopped and said now well actually no we're unlikely to be implementing um, the provisos listed within the EU Copyright Directive. So what does this mean for you, for heritage organisations? It means that it Look, we never got the enhanced exceptions. We had the exceptions that we've got right now, but we're not going to see the sort of the better ones that um, e the EU member states are going to be getting. Um, it means also on a practical basis that the UK remains um, unharmonised with the rest of the EU. So the states across the EU will have a harmonised exceptions regime and the UK will not be part of that. Now, because please remember that the EU um, copyright directive includes exceptions based upon ours. So being out of step is not a significant, um, it's not a significant being out of step. Um, however, for those of you that have students or customers or visitors or clients um, who are based in the EU, it means that the, the sort of status quo remains that what's feasible, the legitimate and lawful activities that can take place um, based upon where the user is based, um, will continue to be out of sync. So in other words, what a user can do in the EU with UK content will be different from what a UK based user can do with UK content. So, um, answering a question, will Brexit affect my collections works on Europeana? And the answer is no. Um, there is no indication at all that if you have uploaded content onto Europeana, the European portal to, to uh, Europe's cultural heritage content, there will be no difference. Any content, as far as I am aware, as far as I understand, will remain on Europeana, that users will still be able to engage with Europeana and the UK will continue to be a contributor to Europeana. So thank you very much for the first question, um, but that um, answer is, as far as we understand at this point, the answer is no. Another question that you sent through, so thank you very much indeed. Um, will providing copies of records to researchers be affected? So again, um, the, as, uh, uh, certainly at this point in time, um, the, the provisos under which you have provided um, copies of records to researchers, those based in the UK, will be unchanged by um, the, uh, certainly by the impending uh, EU copyright directive that will be implemented across Europe or transposed across Europe by April 2021. Um, the, I think the interesting point is going to be for um, heritage organisations that perhaps are involved in teaching activities or heritage organisations forming part of larger um, uh, universities or research-based organisations, the impact that will have on students and collaborative research. So um, again, please remember that what will be feasible in the UK and permissible under the UK's copyright exceptions will not be the same as what's permissible in the U in across the EU. So there'll be a mismatch between what's, what's okay and what's not okay. And it may be that particularly for collaborative research, um, there may be a conversation about carrying out a copying, copying act activity in the EU post April 2021, because there will be more that the researchers in the EU can do under um, the new copyright directive than they can do under the, the UK's copyright legislation. Okay, and I will be happy to explore um, the issue of the EU copyright directive after the presentation. So let's kind of boil this down a little in a little bit more detail and look at one of my pet topics, um, orphan works. So, and I've done an awful lot of research in the last few weeks. Um, the current cross-border copyright arrangements that were unique to EU member states stopped at the end of the transition period. In other words, um, when we left the EU, um, the UK no longer benefited from the cross-border copyright arrangements and actually tracking back, um, I um, note that these were um, 
absent from the withdrawal agreement and also from the free trade agreement. So in fact, um, they were never going to be um, carried through. It was never, as, as I've been told by government, they were never part of the UK government's negotiating strategy. So it was always going to be a done deal. Um, and basically what this has meant is that um, there's been a big impact on the database rights and also the orphan works exception. So let's remind ourselves what orphan works are. Now orphan works are works in copyright where the rights holders are either unknown or cannot be traced. This is an issue of huge interest to me um, professionally and I've um, certainly for the last sort of 12 years or so um, done quite a lot of research work looking at orphan works. I carried out a study in 2009 looking at the um, scale and impact of orphan works on public service delivery focusing on cultural heritage organisations. And in that um, initial research, I actually found that there are about 50 million orphan works. And I, and I have to say that that's, in my opinion, now that's a mere drop in the ocean. My subsequent research, um, I think, has led me to believe that we have hundreds of millions of um, orphan works across the heritage sector. However, the percentage um, that I estimated then based upon um, a large scale survey of about 40 to 50 percent of heritage organisations collection items, I still believe that to be accurate. I should also say too that my research hasn't ended and some of you may know already that from this, uh, January the 1st of this year um, I started a part-time PhD at the University of Edinburgh looking at the impact of Brexit on the management of orphan works. Now it's a part-time PhD so it means my day, day job stays the same um, but I have, a, I have the benefit of having time in order to look at long-term impacts and thank you some of you for already um, some of your kind of contributions and suggestions and also for completing the uh, LACA survey that was sent out um, before the new year as well. Okay, so um, two of the ways in which we um, were able, um, before we Brexited, to manage orphan works. Um, one was the orphan works exception, which we have now lost. And I will um, talk about that again in a little bit more detail. And also we have um, an orphan works licensing scheme run by UK government. So two of the possible solutions to how we manage orphan works. Um, I put them side by side for you because I want you to understand the difference between the two. And it will also help us understand exactly what the orphan works exception did cover. So first of all, the orphan works exception was applicable to cultural heritage organisations. So that's museums, libraries, archives and education establishments. It enabled um, big um, mass digitization projects to take place because it um, provided the ability for cultural heritage organizations particularly to put orphan works online for non-commercial use. Now this wasn't all orphan works, this was um, very much text-based orphan works, audio-visual works like films and sound recordings, um, but any of those um, types of collection items that also included embedded artistic works were also, in were also covered. So a good example was the um, British Library's um, complete uh, catalogue of the uh, feminist lesbian publication Spare Rib, which um, included a number of embedded orphan artistic works. Now, what did the orphan works exception, exception enable? Well, it enabled um, cultural heritage organisations as part of the organisations that were covered to um, place these items online um, as long as they carried out reasonable searches and they recorded the name of the work on the EU Orphan Works database. And it's access to the EU Orphan Works database that um, no longer applies since the UK left the EU. Um, the benefits of the orphan works exception were that um, it was almost like another layer of insurance or the cherry on the cake, that if we carried out our reasonable searches to a standard that we were satisfied with, if a rights holder did come forward, um, as long as we had listed that particular work on the orphan works database, the EU orphan works database, it meant that going forward, we would come to some arrangement with the rights holder, we'd, we'd either take the work down or perhaps pay a license fee. But up to that point, it almost gave us that sort of insurance that nothing could happen for our use up to that point. Um, it's a, it was a free, um, a free benefit, it's an exception. Um, and um, just hold on to that for the minute and we'll come back to that. But I want to also now compare that to the Orphan Works licensing scheme, which is not the same. Um, I think the, the interesting point for us as a sector was that they were launched on the same day back in October 2014. And whilst they both cover Orphan Works, they do so in different ways using different mechanisms. So again, the Orphan Works exception is an exception. You don't, you don't pay for it um, or you didn't pay for it. And it provided you with a scope to put um, items online. 
The Orphan Works licensing scheme was a licensing scheme administered by UK government. It enabled anyone, and it still does, um, it enables anyone to um, apply for a license to use Orphan Works for any use that they require. So that would cover both non-commercial and also commercial uses. Um, there is no restriction on the types of Orphan Works, unlike the Orphan Works exception, nor the type of organisation that could benefit from it. Um, but the application process um, is somewhat different because like any license, it's about applying for a license, completing the details, um, having the intellectual property office verify um, that these works are indeed orphans. So that would be in addition to your own reasonable searches. And then in return for a fee that would be, um, and that is comprised of both an administrative fee and also a license fee. And the fees are available on the intellectual property office website. So the fee scales, um, the beneficiaries of such licenses are granted a license of up to seven years um, or until the rights holder turns up. Um, for use that covers you in the UK only. Okay, so that's the difference, and it's an important difference between the Orphan Works exception and the Orphan Works licensing scheme. Okay, so, and there is a question that we've received about the Orphan Works licensing scheme. The removal of the Orphan Works exception. Now, this means um, that the UK can no longer benefit. Now, I'd like to be clear with you. Um, before we left the EU, I did some analysis, and there, there were up to the point that the UK was no longer a beneficiary of the Orphan Works exception, there were 14, one four uh, UK cultural heritage organisations that had works on the uh, Orphan Works, the EU Orphan Works database, comprising of up to about 6,000 items, 6,000 items. So we're not talking about something that was significantly used. Okay, but it no longer applies. It means that we can no longer benefit from the Orphan Works exception. Something's been taken away from us. And um, we can also um, no longer um, upload, uh, we can either, we can not, no longer upload new works onto the Orphan Works exception, um, Orphan Works database. We can see what's on there. We can see other, co other countries who have got works on there, but the UK can no longer benefit from it. Um, What's been the immediate impact? And I think this is interesting, um, is that, um, and some of you have, have read this, and I would certainly uh, suggest that uh, there's more reading that could be done on this, but as an immediate impact of the uh, UK no longer benefiting from the Orphan Works exception, the British Library removed its archive of spare rib um, from its website. So that was taken down, and the rationale for this was because the UK can no longer benefit from the Orphan Works exception, the British Library was no longer able to publish spare rib. So, um, a question. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what effect Brexit may have on Britons using the EU Orphan Works scheme to register or publish Orphan Works. Are we now tied to the UK version only? And has anything changed if someone from an EU country approaches us for permission to publish an Orphan Work? And I think this is a really interesting question. And I think it sort of ties into the kind of the um, part of this particular presentation focusing on Orphan Works and sort of solidifies our thinking. So I think here my answer is the actual differentiation between the EU Orphan Works exception, okay, which is one solution for dealing with Orphan Works, and also the, the difference between that and the Orphan Works licensing scheme. So the question in two parts is that the immediate impact of Brexit is that yes, um, the UK can no longer benefit from the EU Orphan Works exception. However, bearing in mind and remembering that the two are different, we have the Orphan Works exception, we have the Orphan Works licensing scheme. Um, the second part of this question is, are we now tied to the UK version only? Well, if we're talking about the exception, then no, but if we're talking about the Orphan Works licensing scheme, then yes, the Orphan Works licensing scheme does still apply, and that is a possible solution for you to look at for uh, your reproduction of Orphan Works. But bear in mind, it's not the same as the Orphan Works exception, and the Orphan Works licensing scheme has um, requirements that are different from the Orphan Works exception, i.e. it's a license and there's a fee, there's an administrative charge, there's a cost. OK, um, the third uh, aspect of this, um, which is that um, what happens if someone from an EU country approaches us for permission to publish an orphan work? Well, again, it should be the same as it has been before. Um, if it's a work in your collection and it's an orphan work and they want to publish an orphan work in your collection, then my strong recommendation is that the onus of responsibility is either transferred to them, that they need to sort themselves out in terms of um, perhaps either using the orphan works exception, depending upon the type of work 
network and the type of usage. Um, or alternatively, that they take responsibility for any risk that they're encountering. Or there may be a third option, which is where you go down the route of perhaps carrying out reasonable searches on their behalf. But then again, it would be about understanding um, who carries the risk for any reproduction um, and verifying um, the searches that you carry out and taking that into account in terms of your time and the costs of carrying out reasonable searches on their behalf. So what are some of the other options for dealing with orphan works? Well, um, you can see here that the current state of play is um, there are and there remain four options excluding the orphan works exception because that no longer applies because the UK was not subject to cross uh, border arrangements. Um, so these are don't use if it's high risk, um, if it's going to take you too much time to car carry out reasonable searches, you don't have the capacity, that is certainly an option to consider carefully. Um, use with a risk managed approach. Remember, it's your risk. If you decide to take the risk, you decide that you have mitigated um, the uh, arising or um, potential risks in a way that your organization is happy with, um, then that's your decision. Uh, you have the option of using the Orphan Works licensing scheme, um, but please do bear in mind that the Orphan Works licensing scheme has its shortcomings with regards to reproducing content online. Um, and also, and this is a recommendation from UK government, um, using some of the other exceptions to copyright, particularly the dedicated terminals exception that does apply to heritage, heritage organisations. But in this particular instance, please remember that this is for um, the uh, beneficiaries of the exception are organisations that can enable on-site visits, which at the moment is obviously not happening due to COVID. So the dedicated terminals ex exception cannot be used for online reproduction of orphan works, but may, when our heritage organisations reopen again, be used for visitors that come in. So another question, and thank you very much indeed um, for suggesting this one. Um, the Orphan Works Licensing Scheme is considered unfit for purpose. Are there any plans to reform it? So there have been uh, mutterings amongst um, myself and other colleagues that the Orphan Works Licensing Scheme um, has not gone far enough in order to facilitate um, the mass of digitization of items that is um, administratively too cumbersome and also um, not cost effective for us. And by only having UK coverage, it limits us, particularly when we're working um, using um, online, um, online facilities to communicate and to engage with our audiences. So are there any plans to reform it? Um, as I said, I had a conversation with uh, UK government just after the UK left the EU to get a sense of um, what was planned. Um, as I understand it, UK government is open for conversations and open for discussions about how they can um, amend the scheme so it's more suitable for our sector. But they've also been very clear to me that if there is if there are no um, takers for the licensing scheme, then they are unlikely to amend it. So I think this is sort of the conversation is up for having right now. But we, I think, as a sector, need to be sure that. Um, any amendments to the scheme are um, satisfactory and suit our purposes and UK government uh, would want from us reassurances that if they do go to the effort of amending the scheme that we'll be using it. So maybe um, one might feel from this that we're at a little sort of, um, you know, at a point where perhaps conversations in the next few months would be useful to see where we might go with this. OK, so our second poll from today, um, I'd like to find out from you whether you think that the removal of the EU orphan works exception will impact on your digitization and online publication of orphan works. So if you'd like to vote now, we have a yes, a no, a maybe and an I don't know. If you take about another 10, 15 seconds and we'll see what you all think. OK. So could we have the results, please? So 125 of you, so that's 44% of you think it will do. Um, 52 of you, so that's 18% think that it won't. 27%, so that's 77 of you think maybe. And 29 of you, so that's 10% of you think, I don't know. It's great, okay, thank you very much indeed for contributing to that. Let's move on through our presentation today.
Now, the European Court of Justice, referred to as the CJEU, has been really important over the years for providing um, the UK with rulings and judgments for the interpretation of copyright law. I've given you a couple of important case law that relate to certainly some of the work that I've been doing over the years. Um, the Spenson case and hyperlinking, which provides um, a framework for understanding um, whether you can hyperlink to content and when you can't. Um, there's also um, a fairly recent judgment made in 2019, the Spiegel Online and interpretation of the extent of current news reporting and the quotation exception to which we're party. So if you wish to read up on those. Now, what does this mean um, for us um, now that we have left um, the EU? Well, um, EU Court of Justice rulings that we have had, so that were um, applicable to us, prior to us leaving the EU will still hold. So cases such as these, there's also the NLA versus Meltwater case as well that some of you may be um, familiar with, those will still hold. However, new EU Court of Justice or CJEU judgments that come through from now on will no longer be applicable to um, our interpretation of copyright laws, which, is, which in my opinion is a shame, because I've always thought that these were very, very important for giving us that sort of an additional level of interpretation. However, at the same time, whilst they will not be formally applicable, they will still be referenced. And we may still sort of, if you like, draw on some of the rulings to perhaps um, help UK courts with their own interpretations, but they will no longer apply in the same way that they did prior to the UK um, leaving the EU. Okay, so just if you could bear that in mind um, with regards to interpretation of copyright laws particularly. Right, moving on. Um, another right affected by the UK leaving the EU is a database right. Um, and this again um, refers to um, the cross-border arrangements that we used to have in place um, that are now no longer in place now that the UK has left the EU. And I'd like to just remind you about um, the types of um, data that we may be talking about across the heritage sector. So that would be data that's held in collections and management systems, library systems, archival systems, digital asset management systems, library catalogue records, um, uh, manual filing systems as well. The database right, as I said earlier, um, also referred to as a sui generis right, meant that um, for the effort that we might make in obtaining and presenting um, and including verifying data, we would benefit from the database right that effectively would prevent other people from being able to use a substantial part of that data um, for their purposes. Now, the database right, um, perhaps of all the different types of intellectual property rights, is maybe the one that we have explored less as a sector, although I do know of institutions and organisations that perhaps have used it more than others. And certainly it can be said that in the absence of the database right, which you can see from um, the text in front of you, um, will the benefits will be or have been lost since the EU, since the UK left the EU. Um, there are alternatives that could be explored by heritage organisations, perhaps through contract law and the licensing out of access to data if they felt that that data set was particularly valuable. Um, and it's also important to say that whilst we've lost database rights, um, there will be in certain instances um, databases that are still and remain covered by copyright law. So um, just as a sort of a memoir so that we continue our journey in a fulsome way, um, it means that um, following the UK's um, leaving of the EU, UK citizens, and that would include heritage organisations within the definition here, will no longer be able to hold the database rights for databases created after the 1st of January 2021. But as I said, there are alternatives in terms of exploring, for example, contract law to restrict access or, or grant permissions. Um, there is also um, an important point here about um, the UK and EE member states um, being members of, as I said, international treaties on copyright that also do ensure that um, copyright works, um, and particularly if database um, are remain eligible works, particularly databases that are original. And um, also to reference with regards to the database rights that UK legislation has been amended so that only UK um, 
UK citizens, residents and businesses are eligible for the database rights in the UK for databases created on or after the 1st of January 2021. So there is a sort of, if you like, a little match that's gone on in UK copyright law for the database rights, but it doesn't cover rights with regards to um, database rights in the EEA. So if we take that theme and run that forward into some of the other rights that um, heritage colleagues uh, may have as part of their IP portfolios, and here I'm going to focus in on trademarks and registered uh, community designs, um, the IPO, the Intellectual Property Office, has also um, created a framework so that there is a match between um, UK trademarks and registered design rights for every registered EU trademark and registered community design right. And so what they have done is that they've recorded on the UK's trademark register and the UK design register, those same rights. Um, they have provided the same level of, of legal status as if you had applied for and registered under UK law. They have kept the original EU trademark and uh, registered community design right filing date, um, paperwork, seniority, and also provided effectively a match for match rights. So those of you that have portfolios of trademarks, so maybe you have trademarked a brand, um, so a logo, uh, some kind of representation of your, whether it's your organization or specific strand of activities, you'll need to be cognizant of the level of protection that you have now. And hopefully you'll feel reassured that the level of protection that you had prior to the UK leaving the EU is comparable as a result of the changes that the IPO has put into place. And again, here, when we look at international trade trademarks and design rights. Again, there is confirmation from the Intellectual Property Office that there has been a comparable UK trademark created for every international trademark um, that was protected at the end of the transition um, or protected by the end of the transition period and also a re-registration of UK designs for every international design protected by the end of the transition period. Now, here is a significant change, and it's important that you, you pay heed to this, is where there is an international trademark or a design that's designated in the EU that's been applied for by your heritage organization, but is not yet protected, you will have up to nine months to apply for the same right as a UK trademark or design, and you'll be subject to UK examination requirements and for trademark publication requirements. So here it's about being cognizant, not just of the portfolio, your existing portfolio of trademarks, and design rights, but also any that you have in process of application and being aware of the time limit um, in order to apply for the same right, the same level of protection um, under UK trademark, the sort of match for match that IPO has put in place. And here I would suggest that you go onto the Intellectual Property Office website to find out further information. Um, if we look as well at another member of the intellectual property right family, which some of you um, may be aware of, which are unregistered designs. And again, um, there is confirmation from the intellectual property office that these will continue to be protected in the UK for the remainder of the three year term through continuing unregistered designs. But again, um, an important point for some of you. And again, because this is just an overview today, I would suggest that you drill down in more detail. Um, from the 1st of January 2021, um, the UK uh, made available, or what was made available under UK law, was a supplementary unregistered design, an SUD. Now, this does provide a similar protection to that conferred by the unregistered community design. But here, and this is sort of taking heed of the warning from the Intellectual Property Office, you need to be very aware of um, if you're operating as a business, not to disclose products to ensure that you have the necessary protection. So this is again, being mindful of um, the protection that's offered to you and making sure that if, for example, in the course of conversations or negotiations with third parties, that you don't unwittingly undermine or water down your ability to benefit from the SUD um, by disclosing what you have in your designs. And here again, you know, we often talk about this in the world of intellectual property rights, which is the relationship between intellectual property rights and contract law, and also sort of again another way to protect intellectual property rights, non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements you have in contracts, these all play a part, so IP does not act in isolation. Okay, and another point to bring to your attention, changes to IP rights, 
actions for IP rights holders. So some of you may be um, involved in activities um, where there is a sort of an aspect of parallel exports um, of IP protected goods between the UK and the EEA. Okay, so nothing here that will affect your ownership of these rights, but there may be additional responsibilities that you have. And if we dovetail this in as well to additional responsibilities that some of you will have on the data protection changes that we saw and that we examined last week. Um, also, there will be VAT implications with regards to the UK leaving the EU. So this should all be tied down together and you need to take a contextual view to make sure that if you are already examining examining um, your business and how your business operates in the EU, please make sure you incorporate um, the changes with regards to IP rights that we've discussed today within those broader conversations about how you operate and your obligations. So a question, is there going to be any difference between the impact of Brexit on intellectual property rights in Britain and Northern Ireland or will the same, rule apply, same rules apply? So thank you very much indeed. As far as I understand, the same rules will apply as they have done before. And the changes that we have outlined and that I've outlined today with regards to the management and protection of intellectual property rights will be those same changes that will affect colleagues who are based in Northern Ireland. OK, so the loss of the orphan works exception, um, the changes to the database right, um, extra responsibilities that you have under trademarks and design rights issues, and also the impact of not being a beneficiary of the um, EU copyright directive. So I know that we're running out of time, but I want to make sure that we really kind of complete our session today with kind of giving you an indication of what you can do next. So first of all, to remind you about um, the Naomi Corn Associates compliance methodology, which is about trying to integrate good intellectual property rights management and data protection management and information law management within the heart of your organization, the need for a strong governance framework uh, reflected in your four plans, your policies, your procedures, your tool system standards, and making sure that everyone knows what they should and shouldn't be doing, okay? Policies, for example, are only as good as staff awareness and keeping awareness fresh, particularly now during lockdown. What are some recommendations, specific recommendations that we have for you following today's webinar? OK, so first of all, know what works you've got. OK, know the works that are in copyright. Please, please carry out your copyright audits and your health checks. See what policies and procedures you have in place. Make sure they're up to date, that you've changed them accordingly. OK, they, your policies and procedures should always be reviewed anyway, at least on an annual basis. OK, but please, please make sure that you update anything you have that's referenced the orphan works exception or the registration for your trademarks and processes, etc. Those need to be amended. Um, your risk registers. So if you're going to be um, relying on a risk managed approach, for example, for dealing with your orphan works, please make sure that that's noted in your risk register and that you've outlined clearly your mitigation activities. This is where you can outline your appetite for risk. And here I've also given you an indication of some of the ways in which you want to man you should be managing risk so um, you've got a risk procedure you need to review your reasonable searches so which reasonable searches you're carrying out are they still fit for purpose you're relying on something you drafted 10 years ago okay the internet's changed since there's more databases available please review your takedown policy and procedures like anything that goes wrong whether it's a data breach or an infringement of copyright it's only as good as how quickly you can respond and make it better so if those form part of your risk um, management procedures and outlined um, as um, risk mitigation mi risk mitigation activities in your risk register please please review them look at how you're using the exceptions to copyright so we've mentioned the dedicated terminals exception please uh, make sure that you review how you're using the current framework are you using it to its full ability I mentioned about policies dra um, policy review and drafting um, also uh, as, as a result of the E, uh, UK leaving the EU, your trademark and registered um, design registration process review and look at your portfolio. Review your contracts and licenses. Um, this should always be up for review if you're working with clients and visitors or people who are uh, maybe contributing content, whether it's um, online content or otherwise, make sure that that covers responsibilities regarding copyright. And again, we've mentioned staff training and awareness. Where can you find out more? Well, here's a link to the Intellectual Property Office website, okay, and I've referenced this a few times. It's important you keep yourselves up to speed. Now, we will be issuing guidance. You can jump as well onto our website. Uh, lots of free resources. We'll be having, uh, hopefully, our website 
uh, resources page redesigned shortly so it'll be make it'll be easier for you to find the stuff that you need there is a guide to the exceptions to copyright which is currently available on the heritage digital website that we've um, created and we'll be amending that as well shortly for you so that should be updated um, I've also given you the link to the charity digital website um, in order to keep yourselves up to speed so I know I have taken a little bit longer today to cover the issues but I wanted to give you the depth that this topic requires um, an outline of the issues and also some things for you to do next okay so like the data protection webinar there is plenty of things that you need to be following up on and you need to be deciding on for example your stance on orphan works particularly in order to carve a pathway forward for yourselves so i'd like to say thank you so much for listening to me i hope that you found today useful there'll be plenty of resources to support this webinar and also there are other resources available for you that you can download that I've referenced so if I could open this up to questions Carmen hello nice to see you again hello. nice to see you and I will I was just thinking I've been scribbling down notes um, in in the full knowledge that these slides and the recording and a guide will be available so just to reiterate to uh, to participants that uh, you will be able to have these slides there have been a couple of questions in the chat on that and this recording will be available so don't worry don't uh, don't look back at your scribbles and, and panic um, we've got lots of questions we've got 14 questions uh, we so we are likely to go over the 11 o'clock um, ending time so stay with us if you can if you can't this will be on the recording looking through the questions there are there are a couple of themes there's 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 a few on orphan works there's there's one or two on database rights and there's some on copyright so unlike last week where there was a very simple first question that I think had a, a yes or no answer I don't think any of these do so I'll just I'll, I'll jump in with an orphan works question yeah. um, coming from Robin Sampson they ask how would the loss of orphan works exemption impact community archives putting material up on their website can they no longer use a takedown policy okay so um please thank you very much indeed robin that's a great question so please remember that there were only 14 uk institutions that, that actually used the orphan works exception okay a total of up to six thousand works so not a huge amount of works are on there um, but I think what's interesting is um, the impact that um, this has had actually on the British Library taking down spare rib. Um, I um, will be tracking this as part of my own research and looking at this in more detail. But as far as I am concerned, if your reasonable searches are sufficient um, and you're using a takedown, that there shouldn't be um, any difference between what we have now and what we had before. Um, it's about appetites for risk, it's about perceptions of risk, it's about the practicalities. So regarding community archives, um, your options are still the same um, because in fact, there were very few organizations anyway using the orphan works exception from the UK's perspective. So remember, don't use is, is what UK government would say. Um, obviously they can't, um, you know, tell you that you can use an, a risk managed approach. This will be down to your organization's appetite for risk. Um, I think it's about looking at the types of works in detail that you have. Um, you know, there may be um, in many instances works where truly there is absolutely no way of finding a rights holder. Um, we have absolutely no starting point at all. And so this is about, you know, you making those judgment calls. Um, you always have the orphan works licensing scheme that you can look at as a potential for particularly other types of activities. And then, um, as I mentioned, the dedicated terminals exception that can be relied on um, for works in your collections when you have visitors coming into your organizations. Thank you. Next question. <laughs> okay, the next question comes from Jerka Ryden and it's why is the UK Orphan Works license confined to use in the UK? Very good question, Jerka, and hello, Jerka, as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a decision by UK government, um, and they felt that they were not able to legislate for other countries being able to accept for orphan works to go online. So this is for works in the UK that are held in the UK. So that would include works created by non-UK residents. Okay, so those will come under scope of the of the UK's orphan works licensing scheme, but the UK government has always said that it was never able to provide anything more than a UK based 
um, licensing scheme. Now it's interesting because I do know of other um, uh, sort of equivalents or exceptions. Is Israel, for example, has um, got a sort of a, an exception that they built in that's actually effectively a global exception. So I'm 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 uncertain as to how they've done that and why the UK has gone down this particular route. And I'm sure that um, this will form part of the conversations that a number of us will have with UK government over the course of the next few years about trying to find an alternative. If I could also mention too, that um, there is something I didn't pick up on that I wanted to bring into the questions, which is I mentioned in the EU uh, copyright directive, um, a provision called out of commerce works. Now, this would have been a beautiful thing for us in the UK, because if we had been able to transpose the EU copyright directive into, into the UK, we would have benefited from this, that would have actually meant that we could have put a large amount of orphan works online. So this is a bit of a double whammy for us. Not only don't we get the EU copyright directive, um, which includes this and other provisions, but we have the orphan works exception removed from our legislative framework. So a bit of a shame, really. Now I've noticed Jerk has done a follow up, which I'm, I'm, I've, I've captured there. It says they say, is the Orphan Works license a compulsory license, and hence the confinement? No, it's not. It's not at all. It's an optional license, and the take up has been incredibly low. So there was a whole. Um, the IPO did a whole thing of kind of like pressing a red button when they launched it. I think expecting the floodgate floodgates of UK heritage organisations to buy into the scheme, but it just it didn't stack up for us. So it's not a compulsory license at all, it's optional and it's not just for heritage organisations, it's for any type of anyone, it's for anyone for any type of work. Okay, thanks Jerka. Okay, linked question or hopefully sort of following on from that question from Ksenia Blokina, what are some of the shortcomings of the Orphan Works licensing scheme with regards to online reproduction? Okay, um, so it's a limited, limited license for up to seven years. And um, that means that for some of us who, for example, are in who are recipients of um, heritage funds, uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund grants to digitize collections where they require that works are made available under a Creative Commons attribution license following their policy change in September, there's an incompatibility between a Creative Commons license, which is in perpetuity, and a seven year limited license, right? So that's a starting point. I remember I went to government way back when, um, and I said, look, when they were thinking about the Orphan Works licensing scheme, and I said, look, I said, um, you know, you've got another part of government effectively, you know, um, through sort of DCMS, making funds available for mass digitization, digitization activities, and requirement as of then to make the work available under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial license. And you've got the Orphan Works licensing scheme, which is limited to seven years. The two are incompatible. What are your recommendations? And they said, we well, need to go back to your funders and tell them that. So there you go. Um, so uh, that's number one, one problem. Um, the second problem is that the scheme is for UK um, reproduction only. It only covers works in the UK. So if you put stuff online, it's not covered under the scheme. So there are two, two reasons. And then there are administrative issues that mean you can only apply for up to 30 works in one application and the cost and the time and having to have your searches verified and it becomes an, another sort of laborious part of the process. So those are, in short, some of the reasons why the Orphan Works licensing scheme is incompatible with online reproduction. And I suppose has come at a time when many, if not most organisations are feeling quite time, time poor to add yeah. another kind of process into, into this. Yeah, time and money poor, exactly right. And, you know, it's, it's a really, it's a real problem for us as a sector. So even though the sort of item by item cost is something like 10p, the, the sort of administ the cost of up to 30 watts is an additional 30 pounds. So if you do your maths and you think about the millions of orphan watts we have in our sector and the costs that we're incurring for digitization as it is, and on top of that, then having to carry out reasonable searches up to a government standard, this isn't self certified, this is up to a government standard of searches, which are then verified the application process and then the fee on top of that. And the limitations of the license is, in my opinion, is not a workable solution for online use of orphan works. Okay, we've gone, we've gone over by a few minutes. I want to cover some of the database okay. rights and copyright questions. We're, we're up to 17, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a mix and then we will look to consider them in the, in the guide. But moving to database rights, Martin Newman asks if, if you have database rights over a database created and published before the 1st of the 1st, 
2021, but it's continually it's continually being updated. So the database rights keep rolling. For example, historic environment records. Does the 1st of January 2021 deadline have any relevance? OK, and that's a really good question, Martin. Thank you. And hello. Um, that's a very good question. And I don't have an answer for you, um, but a recommendation from me. And I can look that I can look up the answer and, and just delve a little bit deeper. And that's a very, very good point. Indeed, our, our databases aren't really static. And I think that the sort of the guidance that we have from the intellectual property rights kind of implies that there is a sort of a static nature and it doesn't work like that. Um, my recommendation would be to um, already explore, if you've not done so already, in terms of protecting your databases, using other forms, and I've mentioned contract law. So if it's about enabling other people to reuse a, a certain amount of your um, database, then it's about providing the information about what's acceptable and what isn't within a contract that you have with them, with your users. So certainly I'd look to moving that forward sooner rather than later anyway. Brilliant. I'm going to go there. There are two that sort of concern sound and AV. So I'm going to, to dive into them. Um, the first is from Nikki Hilton. And it says, I have a sound recording that was made in 1983. Right. I thought this was only in copyright for 70 years. I think we've lost you, Carmen. Was added. Oh, so could you repeat that again? I, I, I will. It's a it's a, it's a, a little blip, a little blip. I have a sound recording that was made in 1983. I thought this was in copyright for 70 years, but a colleague told me now it's only 50 years because the extra 20 years was added as an EU extension and that extension no longer applies. Is that right? I don't believe that's necessarily correct. Um, so I think the, um, as, as, as I have understood, um, the, um, the UK being subject to um, EU provisions, which would have been transposed into UK copyright law, still apply. So the variabilities in terms of the duration of protection for sound recordings will not actually be, be, be based around whether the UK has left the EU, but more about the criteria um, upon which that sound recording has, was cr created and also any subsequent publication. That, those more are the factors that would determine the duration as to whether it's 50 years or 70 years. And even there may be um, criteria, for example, if it's Crown copyright as well, that might affect the duration rather than Brexit. So anything transposed into UK law um, that we have had up to this point, that's not a cross-border issue at all that would also be um, more about um, the UK being party and subject to uh, multilateral agreements Berne convention etc etc which have been unaffected by the UK leaving the EU so I hope that clarifies that but thanks Nikki for that and, and, and the second sound related but exhibitions related really um, from Zoe Few when clearing rights for images and AV content for display in exhibitions which tour outside of the UK to the EU, going forward, will heritage institutions be required to clear rights under UK law and EU law? You would always have to have done that. You would always done because you would always have, there was always going to be anyway, a need for um, exhibitions that are touring, um, that the uh, access to those touring exhibitions would be subject to where the touring exhibition was being held anyway. So it would be country specific. So you always would have had to have done that to start with. So the answer is there's no difference. It's just that there would have been, if we had stayed in the EU, oh, there would have been so much if we stayed in the EU, but if we'd stayed in the EU, EU um, we would have then been party to the EU Copyright Directive, which would have harmonized the exceptions across the EU. Therefore, it would have made it easier for things like touring exhibitions for us, that we wouldn't have had to have done that in the same way. Um, and we would have been able to rely on the on the exceptions that were the same being in, in the UK as those being across EU member states. But now it's just gonna, we're just gonna have to continue doing what we should have done before. Naomi, are you happy to stay for a couple more questions? They're many and varied, so I want to, I'm trying to theme, but I may just take them. Um, I, this one caught my eye because it mentions lockdown brain, which I think we can all identify with. So thank you, Anonymous. Um, apologies for lockdown brain, but does Article 14 mean that we can no longer charge a license fee for works now in the public domain to EU customers? We can only charge an image supply fee. 
The answer is I don't know. And I don't think, I think it's still, I think it will still remain. And we're not subject to Article 14. So I don't believe that we will, um, the situation will be any different from what it is right now. Brilliant. There's a second question that asks. Yeah, I don't believe that that will be, I don't believe that that will be changed, but look, never say never. And, and, and again, let, I'm, I'm keeping a very close eye on what this all means. So we will let you know as time goes on, okay? But that's my understanding right now that we will still be able, we'll be continuing to do what we've been doing before. Okay, a, 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 a question around universities, which I think will be interesting and could apply to many people from Katie Sandbrook. What are the implications of the EU directive for universities delivering digital content to students via a virtual learning environment if some of the students are physically based in the EU? Right, okay, so it would mean that there's a lack of harmonisation. So what is, what is um, applicable to the EU students um, will not be the same as what's available to the UK. So at the moment, um, the state of play is that the U UK students are, are actually able to do more with content than um, students that are based in the EU, but that balance will change. And that actually I'd say that fractionally what our UK based, EU based students will be able to do with UK content would be more. Now, that's the theory, but the reality is that actually, um, as you probably know across the um, higher education establishment sort of framework in which you know, our, our teaching and research uh, takes place, there is a sort of a dizzy combination of both the exceptions to copyright and also licensing schemes. And so the reality is that actually, um, you know, we're only really talking about a very small amount of activities anyway covered under the exceptions, and that the majority of activities that will involve um, teaching will co be covered by licenses that we have because the extent of copying is such that it's the licenses that will facilitate that. So actually, I would say the question is more about the role of the licenses than, than this sort of exceptions to copyright. I think that in, in my opinion right now, the biggest impact will be, I think that exhibitions question is a very good one about heritage organizations. I think we, you know, we may have been in a better position not to have cleared rights. I also can see as well that there are certain activities like data and text mining, which we have under UK law, but there is an enhanced version um, that's applicable to EU member states that we no longer party to, we are no longer able to benefit from, which would enable um, potentially text and data mining for commercial purposes that could be really useful for us. And also I think our librarians and archivists are also going to find that the enhanced library and archive exceptions will mean that um, there, there's less that we would have been able to have facilitated in terms of access um, now than if we had stayed part of the EU. So I hope, thank you for the question. I hope that helps to answer the question as well. There are a couple of questions around uh, fair dealing, the fair dealing exception. And I know that um, you have a you have a guide to exceptions to copyright, including fair dealing that exists at the moment. Um, we're looking to get Naomi to re-look at that as part of Heritage Digital a bit later on in, in the programme. So there will be something coming out from this programme on the on fair dealing and exceptions to copyright that will incorporate all of this learning. OK, I'll, 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 I'll take two more. Um, we, OK, anonymous attendee asks, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is specifically in regards to, to Brexit or, or more general, Please, could you talk a little bit about the status of original records from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries? Do these count as unpublished works? What is their copyright status? Okay, so it depends on how they've been made available. Um, it depends on original records. It depends on what types of records we're talking about. But the um, I think you're referring to the 2039 provisions. So under UK copyright law, not changed. Any works um, that were created by um, an author who died um, before 1969, but were unpublished by the 1st of August 1989, are potential candidates for being protected by copyright until the end of 2039. Okay, so this is irrespective 
of when they were created. So this is really old records, like manuscripts and letters. So you could easily have, for example, um, the letters of T.E. Lawrence. So this is Lawrence of Arabia. Um, whilst um, he died more than 70 years ago, his unpublished letters are still candidates for being in copyright until the end of the year 2039, because of this proviso in UK copyright law, as I said, that's not changed. So the answer is it, de it depends if it falls within those criteria. And of course, it's a your question is a great question because um, there is a correlation between the very long duration of copyright for unpublished works that can last until the end of 2039 and the volume of orphan works that we have and now the loss of the orphan works exception and us the UK not being able to benefit from the um, EU out of commerce works, works provision so we've not really moved forward at all in how we manage orphan works so I think that that's a very very good question but yes that still holds and there's a, a millions of items that are locked up and and certainly this is something that um, I did mention to UK government about whether that would be an area that they would open up again for review and the answer was that with the queue of legislation since Brexit so we're not we're talking about non um, copyright related legislation just legislation post Brexit and also <clears throat> the disruption to process following COVID it's very unlikely that we'd see any headway in trying to um, amend the 2039 provisions anytime soon. I, uh, I, I'm being kind of summoned by my cat alarm clock in the background so <laughs> I will take our last question. Sure. From an anonymous attendee, does Brexit have implications for privacy laws and the use of model or property release forms in a photographic archive? Will yeah. we need to change our processes and documentation around this? Oh, it's a very good question indeed. Okay, so um, this is the this is one of the areas that we looked at in our last um, webinar on data protection. So the answer is yes, there is impact um, on a very basic um, level. As I said in the last webinar, you'll need to change reference to GDPR to UK GDPR, okay? Because it's uh, it's now be trans uh, GDPR is now being has been fully transposed into UK law. Um, you'd also need to be cognizant of um, the um, potential status of um, personal data which would be kind of contained within collection items um, as a result of you know transitionary changes that are likely to happen I mentioned in my last webinar about adequacy um, in short um, it's not going to I don't believe it'll be substantial but it'll be part and parcel of what you should be doing anyway as part of ongoing data data privacy review and um, I mentioned in the last webinar that an important exemption for our sector which is archiving in the public interest is unchanged as a result of Brexit okay so there's no change there so that means that there will will still be um, an understanding or continuation of what we're doing in terms of processing of that type of content thank you for the question Brilliant. I'm going to, to end us there. We will, uh, we can take a runoff of the remaining questions and, and see about fitting them into the guide. But just to sort of represent all 350 of us that were on the call this morning and say, thank you, Naomi, for all of your insight and, and knowledge. Thank you so much. I, I hope I've been clear. There's been an enormous amount of content to go through. So thank you for bearing with me. Thank you so much for your questions, for your engagement. Um, I really hope to see um, some of you really soon in person. That'll be an absolute joy. Carmen, thank you so much as ever for amazing hosting of this event and for everyone at Heritage Digital and Charity Digital as well for sort of laying this on for us. So take care everyone and see you soon, hopefully. Okay, see thanks. you soon. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.